Um, thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be invited to speak here. Um, it's a fantastic venue, and um, I'm really happy to discover this morning that the, the home of data for Edu Service Swindon, I'm into big data projects, and so I'll be looking for some space on the servers, hopefully. Um, I'm going to talk about mobile, 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 which was actually the um, phrase that Eric Schmidt used um, of Google when he spoke at the Mobile World Congress where he was trying to say that mobile is everything now and it's the platform. So hopefully I'm going to give you some insights into why that might be the case and why it's not just about the iPhone but other things beyond that. Um, just a little bit about myself so you know where I'm coming from. I'm not an educationist at all. I'm not in the education area. Uh, I call myself a mobilist because I do all things mobile, technology, business, um, even the kind of philosophical aspects of it. I've been 20 years in this sector, um, really since the beginning of digital cellular. Uh, I have 16 patents in this technology. Um, I've worked on projects in most places. Um, so I know pretty much what's going on around the world in mobile. And I was the founder of one of the earliest, if not the earliest, mobile startup in Europe. And I've been chief architect for Motorola. Uh, recently started the um, O2's incubator program for startups. And I'm a hacker, so I still build stuff. And I'm an author. I've got several books, and there's a new one coming out this year. But for today, I'm the kind of setting the scene guy to, to give you a flavor for the state of the art, if you like, of mobile and what's happening. I think a good starting place is to um, think about where we've come from and where we are now. And a lot of people talk about this mobile 2.0 or 2.0 uh, idea. And there's a lot of um, you know, fluff in, in these kind of definitions. But I think what sums it up is on the left there is the, the Nokia 7110. Did anyone own one of these devices? OK, you're the old hands, the, the, the original mobilists. This was back in 1999. It was the first case of an internet-capable device. You could connect to the internet, albeit badly, through some WAP pages. Very clunky user experience. And now we've moved over to this phase where we have, with the iPhone and many other devices like it now, the first internet-centric mobile device, where internet is really at the center of the device, and it's a usable experience. And for most smartphone, iPhone users, uh, they spend more time using the data functions of the device typically than the traditional calling and texting. So this really indicates that we've arrived at this point where connecting to the internet using mobile is a possibility, a very real possibility. And it's one where we're kind of seeing a tipping point now with this proliferation of smartphones. At the moment in the UK, it's probably about 15% smartphone penetration but maybe within the next three years, this will be something like 40%. And 80% of the devices being sold in that time frame will probably be smartphones. So within the next three years, and probably in your thinking, you're planning out this far, um, most people, you can assume, will be able to consume internet-type services on their mobile with relative ease. And the interesting development uh, recently, of course, is uh, the emergence of these kind of possibly new categories of device like the iPad. And what I see as the key differentiator here is whereas the iPhone and the smartphone is really an internet-centric device, very usable, where you can do stuff besides talking, these kind of iPad devices are enabling you to be more productive. You can do more stuff faster. And what has been very interesting is to see the rapid take-up of this new um, modality of mobile interface. Um, one example I picked from education is this blackboard.com guys who have a very interesting service to enable educators to manage uh, the syllabus and their classes and what have you. They've already produced a really interesting uh, application for the iPad that really works well and they've thought through the whole touch paradigm at this kind of size and scale and the fact that it's all very at, the, at your fingertips and produced a very nice application and you may want to check that out as a, as a good example of, of user interface design and mobile experience tuned to these new types of device. Now, when we talk about mobile 2.0, we don't just want to talk about the tech. We want to talk about the user behaviors, what's new, what's changed. 
And the big difference has been the migration from talking and texting, which is all you could do with a mobile and is still what most people do, um, to <coughs> different types of uh, activities. You can organise lunch, detect offers uh, with things like Groupon, uh, you can find places, share video clips, you can even hail a taxi. You can even hail a taxi that's the nearest one to you that's free, um, which is pretty handy. You can sense a friend of a friend, someone who knows someone you know. You can compare shopping prices, scan and share the bill. All these are stuff that you can do now with apps. And of course, we've all heard the phrase, there's an app for that. There pretty much is everything you can think of now, there's an app to do, do, do stuff. So we're, we're arriving at a place where you can kind of run your life on your mobile. And you know that may sound um, still sci-fi or far-fetched for many of us, but this really is the kind of place we're arriving at very rapidly. And there's a convergence of many other technologies behind that that I'm going to mention in a minute that really make this a reality. What this brings uh, for everybody, and educationalists are no exception, is many opportunities, but there are still many challenges. And the challenges are not just the technological ones, but there are kind of ethical ones, uh, philosophical ones, and all kinds of uh, really interesting things now that are possible and interesting questions that arise out of this mobile 2.0 phenomenon. So one thing that I often get asked is exactly how ubiquitous is this mobile 2.0? What is the penetration? How much do people really use their mobiles? And um, I like to go into a few stats here just to give you a flavor. First of all, how big is it on the global arena? Um, some interesting stats at the top. The first laptop in 1985, and now you know, many years later, we have about 400 million laptops in circulation. Uh, first iPod, 2001, now we have 200 million iPods. But mobiles is a much bigger play. There's 1.2 million mobiles sold every year. And this is globally, of course. And in 59 countries, What's interesting is there are more mobiles than people, and by that I don't mean the ones we all have in our cupboard, like the 7110s our friend up there had. I mean active mobile subscriptions, SIMs that are live on the network in 59 countries. There are more of those than there are people, which means you know some people have more than one device, of course, and that's something that's set to increase with things like iPads, where we're going to have embedded micro SIMs. You may have a SIM in your car. And in a minute, I'm going to talk about this whole plethora of sensor devices that we're going to see an explosion of soon, um, each possibly with their own SIM. So the number of mobile connections is, is still increasing quite dramatically. Uh, there's 1.2 active email users uh, on the planet versus 2.5 billion active text users or thereabouts. This has probably increased uh, since I wrote the slide. 50% uh, of email senders expect uh, a reply within 24 hours. That's the kind of time frame, the responsivity that we're looking at with email versus 84% of texters usually expect to want to reply within five minutes. And I'm sure we're all familiar with this. And now there are things like Twitter. I mean, it's driven the, the kind of uh, immediacy uh, even beyond that. And so mobile is everywhere. Thanks to Mike Ellis for this wonderful phrase. Um, it really is a, a platform that's everywhere in every sense, and it's an everywhere in that you can run stuff on it all over the planet, all over the place. So just to dive into some more statistics about this trend from voice and text to other things, um, this is from uh, the Nielsen Group, and it's looking at um, the millions of people doing mobile tasks in the UK besides talking, and you can see at the top there that 21% um, of mobile users now are internet users. So they're using the internet on their mobile. 8% uh, of people have downloaded apps. And in fact, this is quite dramatic growth from last year, and I'll mention that in a minute. And um, texting, though, is still by far the biggest data application on the mobile. And um, texting is by no means dead. And in fact, there's a kind of interesting things that uh, I'm working on and other people are working on to, to make texting even more powerful and relevant than it already is. Um, but it's still the number one mobile data application. If we look at some uh, 
internet statistics. Uh, these are taken from uh, Opera, who um, <coughs> provide the Opera mini browser. Does anyone use the Opera mini browser? Okay, a few of you. Okay, it's an, there's enough of them out there. There's at least 100 million instances that you can get quite meaningful stats back from the, uh, the use of it because actually um, a lot of people don't know if you're using Opera Mini, it's going through a proxy in the cloud. So in fact, um, it's, it's perfectly possible to see what you're looking at. Um, so they, they kind of aggregate the information and, and share it. And this is just a UK snapshot for March um, in the UK. So the page view growth since March last year is 74.2%. That's the um, amount of stuff that people are looking at, the amount of pages. And the unique user growth is 40%. So 40% increase in the number of unique users um, using the, the Opera Mini browser, but really we could say the mobile internet. And the interesting stuff to look at is the top 10 sites that are accessed using the mobile. Number one is Google. And this is no surprise, um, and Google have very interesting stats. Incidentally, when do you think, this is a, 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 not a rhetorical question, you can give me an answer, when do you think is the peak time for searching using Google on a handset? Anyone want to offer an answer who's not a mobile person? What, in, in the UK, what is the peak time? doesn't matter where you are in the world, actually. 7 o'clock Friday evening. No, it's later than that. The peak, 2 o'clock in the morning, well, uh, a few of us, yes, like uh, myself. Um, no, the peak time is about 11 p.m. on mobiles. And on uh, desktops, um, laptops, the peak time is round about lunchtime. So that shows you actually that surfing in bed is, a, is the new reading, you know. So people aren't reading novels. Uh, they're, they're, they're surfing in bed. So this actually is, is, is true. I mean, this is what's happening. Um, so search, of course, is a key use case. So we expect that to be at the top. And search is by no means a complete story. There's so many different ways we can think about search. And any um, person working in the field of applications and data needs to have a search strategy. Uh, the second one is Facebook.com. <coughs> How many people here are on Facebook? Okay. How many people here use Facebook on their mobile? Okay, a lot of you. Okay, it's more or less about 40%, right? Um, so Facebook.com, looking at what your friends are up to, another classic use case of the mobile. BBC.co.uk, actually it's the news site. Um, uh, no surprise there. Wikipedia is the fourth. People are looking stuff up on their mobile whether it's in the pub to challenge their friends or whatever it is, or cheating at a um, pub quiz game, things like this. But these are the key use cases, search, friends, news, info. And down the bottom there that's creeping on is Twitter and this idea of some kind of real-time conversation uh, in the public arena. This is actually um, dramatically increasing. And I'm going to mention a little bit of that. I was fortunate enough to go to the Twitter conference, developer conference in San Francisco where we built some apps. Um, just really interesting stuff going on with Twitter and the whole movement to the real-time web. So the next slide is showing, uh, this is from AdMob's network. They insert ads into mobile web pages. And so again, they have enough uh, usage that these are fairly accurate um, figures in general that we can take to look at behaviors. Uh, smartphone access to the internet is on the increase, no surprise. Feature phone as a percentage is decreasing, although as a total feature phone is on the increase. As we saw uh, on that last slide, which I, I failed to mention, most of that mobile internet access is still happening on feature phones. But the growth is being driven and the acceleration is from the use of smartphones. And then down here we have interesting growth of these so-called mobile internet devices, which are things like iPod Touches, um, Nintendo DSs, and um, you know maybe the iPad would now go into that category, or the non-3G one, it's, it's not clear. So we're seeing uh, growth every year in people accessing this. This is real stuff. So you know if there's any doubt still about whether or not people can and do access the internet on their handsets, I mean, the figures show that this is actually something that's growing very rapidly, 
and within the next three years, as I said, with 80% sales will be smartphones, these figures will be through the roof, you can assume that you can have a conversation, you can connect with your users in a very meaningful way using mobile. So the drivers overall of the mobile 2.0 explosion or growth uh, are first and foremost actually the availability of more data-friendly tariffs. The fact that you can have a fixed rate tariff, you know how much you're paying, is the number one driver uh, of mobile internet usage. So in a country where they have feature phones predominantly, not too many smartphones, what you see is when you introduce the uh, friendly tariffs, you get an increase, sometimes very dramatically, in the um, uptake of mobile internet. And Google have some interesting charts where they show uh, they can track very easily when there's a special offer made, like in, I saw one in Singapore, where at the weekend they're offering you free data, the huge spikes in the internet traffic. So it shows people will use this even with a relatively clumsy handset uh, if it's economically um, possible and viable for them. So the second aspect, of course, is increased device usability, which we mentioned, the smartphone proliferation, and now these kind of pad devices. Um, and you know, I think there's going to be a lot of interesting uh, activity in that space. And then faster and fatter networks. We have the 3G+, Plus, and um, within that smartphone period we're talking about, the three years, we will see uh, the introduction commercially of LTE services, where in theory you can have 100 megabits per second on a wireless device. Uh, greater Web 2.0 centricity in general, more and more of us are engaged in some way with the internet, whether it's shopping at Tesco's or using Facebook, more and more of our lives are in the digital domain. So this in fact is driving the, um, a lot of the innovation in mobile, it's actually driven by consumer demand. Uh, social networks are mobilizing, this has been, had a tremendous uh, impact on the uptake of uh, mobile services. And then, of course, app stores leading to many new consumer habits, um, greater user participation. There's, there's actually quite a bit of uploading going on now. This is growing significantly. And, and the fact that you can make money in this arena, I mean, that's really been one of the key drivers in attracting a lot of developers to the app store, the iPhone app store, was this kind of gold rush effect where you could make lots of money out of um, uh, applications. Now, in terms of, uh, from the, the, the supply side, um, the question is, is this platform accessible right, to developers, publishers, creators, ideators, people who want to put stuff out there, services like yourselves? Well, with 1.0, the answer was no. I mean, it was a categoric no. The, the, it was a very closed universe, walled garden affair, very difficult to uh, launch any meaningful services. But now we're in this period where the answer is definitely yes. It's much easier with 2.0 to create services, to put stuff out there, because we have this kind of um, new ecosystem in which everything is um, open. What's happened is the, the shift, really, has been the center of gravity shifted from the, the cellular operator world to the internet world, to Web 2.0 as the, the platform on which services are developed. Uh, and most mobile services are, in fact, web based services that are then made available via the um, mobile. And even the apps that run on the iPhone, a lot of them are chatting to the network. So we have all this open um, platforms, and I'm a great believer in open, and I think we should continue to drive the open agenda. Um, and in fact, there's, there's many uh, threats to this, in fact, with things like Twitter being a so-called open platform. But when you um, look at what, what's really going on, I mean, they're trying to really dominate the universe with real-time buses, if you like, well, a messaging bus. Um, and this is, in fact, belongs to them. It's, uh, it's theirs. It's not open. And I think we should have open standards for this kind of stuff. So where are the trends? Where is this? What's happening right now? I, mean, I don't want to talk too futuristically. Um, I'll, I'll end on a couple of futuristic notes. Um, but what's happening right now and in the next three years in this smartphone era that's, that we should be paying attention to that's interesting? Well, I've tried to highlight some of the key uh, trends. The, the, the four bubbles at the top there are kind of what's happening in the mobile world. And the three down here, which I hope you can, you can see the text on those, uh, are what's happening on the, on the platform side, on the web side. And these are significant trends. So in the mobile world, we're seeing, as we've already told, um, this smartphone adoption increase. So this is a major um, uh, element because it's driving new user behaviors 
That means that users can use your stuff. They can consume digital services. Faster access. I mean, we already have ubiquitous 3G. Um, it's definitely um, a struggle in some places to get good access. Um, if you go to San Francisco, where everyone on, is walking along with an iPhone, it's very difficult to get a good signal, actually. Um, and they're, they're hitting the, the barriers of what's physically possible. Um, you'd have to put a cell site you know, in every Starbucks or something. Um, and there's enough of those in, in San Francisco to do that. But um, rich user interfaces. The old um, mobile experience was very clunky. We're seeing now the possibilities to have a very rich user experience. Um, HTML5 is something that's going to drive that. So HTML5 is really the latest standard, if you like. And it's, it's, uh, it's probably something that's going to drag on for 20 years. But it, it's coming out bit by bit. What it means is we can do things that are kind of like flash-like, using the flash-type technologies in browsers natively. And so we can offer rich experiences. And there's many other features um, that are part of this you know, giant um, standard or collection of ideas. Um, sensor proliferation. The idea that, if you think about it, every um, phone has a camera on it, that's a sensor, they have accelerometers to detect movement, and there's all kinds of really interesting stuff happening with sensors that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, this is a key um, development, I think, in the home mobile space. On the uh, internet side, um, we're seeing three key trends. The one is cloud computing, the availability of this elastic uh, on-demand computing resources, whether it's in the EduServe Swindon data center or on Amazon's cloud or a, a Google app engine or wherever it is. This is really a huge and dominant um, trend. Uh, social computing. What this means is the idea that more and more applications are cognizant of the idea that it's a person using it who has connections with other people and connections with certain interests. And there are kind of pieces of software, if you like, that are, that are arising out of the internet that just understand people. And so the way um, uh, software engineers are beginning to think is not in this very old-fashioned functions and objects kind of way, but in kind of a people-centric way. And so social computing is really what's <coughs> the emerging theme, if you like, of thinking of new types of ways of writing software. And then the real-time, or as I'm going to mention in a minute, what they call the right-time web now, is really this thing that's been driven by Twitter. The idea that second by second by second, you can um, understand what's going on in the world. You can get status updates from different uh, uh, people, from even machines. Um, and th there's a whole uh, array of things going on. And perhaps some of you are um, tweeting. At the Mike, are you tweeting at the moment? So he's tweeting. Anyone else tweeting at the moment? There's quite a few of you, you see. So as I speak, other people, we don't have the live stream. Now, hey, they don't need it. They can read the Twitter stream, right? Uh, it, it's a bit more condensed, of course. So all of these things are happening. And we're, we're arriving at a point where you, you can have kind of true digital immersion. I mean, it's possible to, to move your life as we are into the digital domain and then remain immersed in it everywhere you go. Um, and that's really fascinating. And one of the areas that I really love is the um, augmented reality. So this is talking about sensors, the fact you have a camera and a compass, an accelerometer. On your handset, you can point your handset up into the, um, uh, into the space, and it can overlay information. And um, you've got things like Google goggles down here, where this is a new type of search. You, you point your camera uh, phone at an object, and the search engine will try and find that object <coughs> in its huge database and then stream you information about that object. And in fact, the, the beta version of Google Goggles does face detection, but because of the ethical um, question marks about that, they, they actually haven't released that feature. But what it can do is if you, if you point it at me uh, and it knows who I am, which it probably does from my picture on the internet, you can immediately tell that's Paul Golding. So you could be on the tube, you know, or not the tube in London because we don't have uh, uh, coverage in Barcelona. Um, and I think we're going to get it to the Olympics. But you could be, you know, um, think someone you think you someone thinks you're just um, tweeting or whatever. And you actually got to pick. You, you're looking at their face and you're streaming a live stream, you know, of, of their wiki page or whatever. 
in, so, you know, I'll let you think about what that can be used for. Um, maybe kids will be pointing phones at teachers and finding out what they're all about <laughs> when they're not teaching, which is often an interesting and kind of can be a shocking thing. So um, this is augmented reality. Alongside that is the Internet of Things. This is what some people are calling Web 2.0 is the Internet of Things all this stuff out there you can connect to the internet and there's really interesting stuff happening like with these Arduino boards, these tiny little boards where all the hackers now, their attention, a lot of the, the hacking community has moved away from kind of software stuff to, to hard stuff, you know, back to the whole, we thought hardware was dead but it's come back alive because it turns out you can build all these interesting gadgets and then people hack into their cars like if you've got a Toyota um, Prius as I have, people have hacked in and then they run software on it so you know where you're going, you're going to the nearest Starbucks, it tweets a coffee for you, and, the, and, and then there's, there's a machine which actually is in San Francisco where there's a bagel oven and it will tweet you when the bagels are ready. So, so you know, you can, you can imagine. Um, I'm not sure what the education um, potential is there, but that's for you guys to figure out. So the Internet of Things. You can uh, enable stuff, physical hard stuff. Um, could be books. In the, uh, do people still read books? I don't know. Could be books in the library. Could be artifacts in the museum. Uh, or, or these wonderful exhibits that I, I was looking at out, out uh, in, the, in the foyer here. So let's um, talk about this right time web. Uh, I think that this is really where it's at. This is to me is the key slide if you're a techie. I should have asked how many of you are technologists or software type people? Okay, so this slide is for you. Um, I hope the rest of you will uh, appreciate it. What uh, we have with mobile is this idea, I think, of the right time computer, which is, means the right information at the right time delivered to the right person, hopefully. And um, what I'm advocating and what I think is going to happen is this um, excitement about Android and iPhone OS and all these things, web OS now with the Palm, um, is, is not really where the thinking is going to be at. These are just enablers. I think where the thinking will be is in what is the layer on top of that? Are we at a stage now where we should think about a person operating system? Because a lot of what's driving computing now in the social computing era with Facebook and things like this is what is it happening to me? What are my interests and my friends' interests and my family's interests and my teacher's interests and all of these things? So when you look at profile status, intent, which you can figure out people's intent by the way they're tweeting, for example, and there are experiments that demonstrate this very um, convincingly. Their context, schedule interests, how they're tagging things, photos and what have you. It's possible to form a complete kind of alter ego of the person in the digital domain. And I think that the person operating system is really where the innovation will be. So that we get away from this kind of antiquated idea of computers with files and cap I mean my kids don't even know what a filing cabinet is or, or, or you know these files and folders they've never <coughs> used them I don't think um, so we're moving away from that and I think with on the on the UI side we see a lot more kind of 3d and virtual world type of interfaces but we're gonna have a kind of person-based operating system at the top and this the mobile phone will become the personalized computer. We've had the PC, the personal computer, which means just it was my own instead of some mainframe. The, the mobile is really the first instance of a personalized computer. Everything about it is you. And increasingly it will be the nexus, to use Google's um, trade name there, of, of your, your digital life and what you're doing and what you're about. And um, beneath that then is the web operating system. The web is rapidly becoming like an operating system. We're not interested anymore in the lower level stuff like the HTTP protocols and all this. There's huge blobs of software sitting on top of that that we can build interesting things with. And um, it's becoming increasingly real time in nature. It's possible to find out second by second what's going on that's of interest to you and into your life and to what you want to achieve out of life. So underneath that is this big infrastructure play, which is essentially cloud, um, the cloud computing uh, platform. And big data over there on the left is a huge component of that. And in fact, where most of the innovation is right now, I'd say, in the internet world is in these big data projects. Making economic value out of unthinkably large amounts of data is really where the play is. That, and, and that's where you need to think. If you had all of your data 
in, in your, fear of, your sphere of interest available to you that you could somehow query, what could you do with that information? So what does this all mean? So just to now get on to a, kind of, uh, a few closing points. What's the meaning of the, all of this? Now, um, one of my favorite authors um, is Neil Postman, or was Neil Postman. Uh, I mean, he's passed away. And he was a kind of media theorist, and he talked about how technology is transformative. And it's like, you know, once you put a, a drop of red ink, he said, in the water, there's no pulling it back out. It all mixes in. And an example that he gave, which I like, is that Europe plus the printing press when it came along didn't equal just Europe plus a bunch of books. It actually created a new Europe. It transformed the way we thought about the world. In fact, I like to think of this as the first augmented reality. Because your reality until that point was your experience of the world local to you. Your friends, you know, what the, what the village uh, doctor told you or, or your, your head of your family or whatever. And suddenly you had this idea where you could receive knowledge from afar. You know, you could find out about the world in ways you'd never uh, understood. Because your, your world up until that point was just limited to your media experiences. So I think this is the first augmented reality and then followed, you know, many um, centuries later by the telegraph. Uh, and I had a profound impact and you know it's often interesting to reflect on this the fact that you could be sitting in one place and you could hear the news about what was happening in another town which we all take for granted uh, and we've seen that we've even this has been transformed recently with things like Twitter how Twitter in fact there are so many stories of political activism and reporting uh, being enabled by the fact that someone was able to tweet uh, about the experience and people are immediately able to, to have some kind of connection and, and, and uh, affinity with that experience in a totally different part of the world. So what's the meaning in terms of, of mobile? Well, personalized mobile is also transformative. The, a person plus a right time computer, which is, you know, I, I think we should think about these things, they're, they're computers. Um, I mean, the, the iPhone has easily a hundred times the computing power of the first Pentium um, Dell P60 machines, P60 machines. If you add up all of the processing power on the iPhone, not just the CPU, but the GPU and all these things, it's a tremendous amount of computing power. If you add these things together, it's not just personalized computing, you know, it's an incidental fact. It's actually, I think, we're arriving at a new person, if, if you like. And, and, and what we're seeing, I think, is the advent or emergence of augmented cognition. The fact that with the availability of real-time information, sensory information about the world you're in, it actually um, changes your ability to think and understand the world around you in real time. And you can imagine, and I've done these experiments, where you're wearing a set of glasses like this, and you can project into them uh, information in real time. I could be doing face detection. Uh, see who Andy is, what he's about, what he's tweeting. Uh, you could mention something and I could be looking at it in real time. Um, you know, whether or not you think that's a good idea or a bad idea, um, <clears throat> I, I kind of love that stuff. Um, but it changes, it can change the way we think about the world. And I think this is the opportunity in, in M-Ed or M-Learning or whatever it's called, is in augmenting, augmented learning or kind of right where learning keep putting all these new buzzwords in. Every talk has to have a buzzword, right, Mike? So this is mine. Right where learning. It's about education and learning at the right time and place. And why does it have to be at a set time in a set place? The right information um, you know, that that person needs for them to learn and understand about the world they're trying to learn. And even the right type of thinking you know, it, we don't often stop to think about thinking uh, in the kind of de bono sense. Mm -hmm. But with these, if you have a personal computer, I mean, imagine it's a very powerful device you have on you all the time. Why can't it enhance how you perceive the world? It can. It's already possible. And there are very interesting experiments um, being done uh, in this area of augmented cognition already. So I think the EduServe, if you like, innovation challenge um, is to think about, you know, what is right where and what, what do we mean by right? What is a right education if we can do it any time, any place? What is right thinking? I mean, it, it, these things need to be debated, they need to be thought through because in the next three years with the iPads and all these kinds of devices, there's no doubt that you can invent new modes of learning 
and some of the speakers later, I'm sure, are much uh, more expert and have great insights into this, and I encourage you to listen to them. And how can UK learning institutions lead in this space? And this is really the future, is education, and it's M education. There's already tons of experiments going on with smartphones in schools uh, and the use of these technologies in universities. What can we invent? How can we invent a new future using these um, uh, technologies and possibilities? I think that's the challenge that we need to debate uh, today and, and from here on out, and how can we lead uh, in this um, charge? So um, that, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. And if there are any questions, I think I've bombarded you with a lot of information. So does anyone have questions? talk. I thought it was an excellent overview and very, very stimulating. So um, now over to you, really. Any questions for Paul? Uh, there's a, actually, just hold on a minute. We have got roving mics just because of the live streaming, which I understand is back on. Is that right? Yeah. So we are live streaming now, so that's good. Hmm? Right. It's a bit flaky. Paul, um, Eric Burrows from HSO. Um, a question... You paint lots of possibilities, but I'm wondering personally, what's your moral, ethical, societal framework checklist which stops this technology pushing us to somewhere we don't want to go? Um, that's a good question, uh, and um, I think it needs to be debated. I mean, there is no answer. There, there are so many new possibilities. For example, um, you know, you can you can leave uh, information now pinned in the air. I mean, that's what people are effectively doing with things like Foursquare. You know, I could pin a note outside of a classroom or outside, someone could pin one outside of my house saying this guy's a loser, you know, and, and don't live here or whatever. Don't so, so what's to say, you know, he has the right to do that? Does it become uh, libelous and all these things? There's, uh, th there's, no, there's no answer, I mean, to a lot of these new questions. But I think it's important to debate them, um, and hence why I made the point about what is right. You know, what is right thinking? What is right? I mean, I yeah. Right. yeah. Yes. Um, I'm not sure where my line is yet because um, uh, I haven't done anything that um, you know that where I've, I've definitely said no, I won't touch that. But there are areas that I have some concerns about and doubts about. But um, I think the, the, the best response is to accept that, as, you know, as Neil Postman said, the, the, the genie's out of the bottle, really, and once the technology's there, it does transform. So we need to make sure we're controlling that transformation in a way that's productive and creative and gets what we want. Uh, and th that's the benefit of having these kind of open forums. Uh, uh, at, at Brian Kelly, Creative Commons license for question. Um, I think that was a great, great overview, and you were talking about the huge take-up of mobile technologies uh, throughout the, the globe, and you were just answering a question about the, the ethical issues associated with this. You didn't mention the, um, either the opportunities or the barriers for people with disabilities, so I know there are some concerns that we might be driven by these great new iPhone technologies, but they are, actually might, we might be inventing new barriers for people who have difficulties accessing these mobile devices. Any comments on that? Um, well, uh, there are, you know, with any technology, there, there are always, you know, the, the cutting edge, if you like, is, is driven by whatever commercial innovation, um, typically, you know, commercial objectives. Um, but um, so it's not always going to be accessible to everyone. Um, but I think that with mobile technology, I mean, I see a lot of examples where, it, in fact, enabling new types of behavior for people who need um, extra access to things. So um, you can use mobiles to have a, a sort of sixth sense about the world. There's applications that enable um, blind people to see the world um, through the, the uh, detection in the camera of, of objects and turning visual stuff into sound. Um, I think with um, some of the touch paradigms are much easier to use, although you know, we may find them clunky. And I'm a great supporter of this type of innovation. 
And um, it's a good question, and, I, and I, I hope everyone heard that. You know, we should always be thinking about how we design for everyone, uh, especially when it comes to learning opportunities. So th thanks for that question. Thank you. Bill Ashraf, uh, University of Sussex. Uh, I, I, I started uh, using text messaging in my lectures uh, in 2005, I think. Uh, but I, but I find it really useful from the point of student engagement. But I think the, the main sort of barrier we face at the moment in institutions and universities is trying to get that technology out there. And I think one of the key things, while the technology is absolutely fantastic and I'm all for it, I'm a bit sort of geeky in that way, but it's how I, how I can persuade and I guess how people in the audience can persuade our academic colleagues who tend to lag probably at least one or two generation phones behind our students, how we can actually get them engaged. And also very, very key to the, the universities talking about businesses, what effect that's going to have on the business, the student experience, and, and looking at the evidence to see whether it actually does actually make any difference other than just a, a whiz-bang toy. And I think that's probably lacking in the literature and lacking in sort of large-scale studies. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. So, um, I mean, there's two, two parts there. Uh, yeah, we definitely need to demonstrate that these technologies have an advantage and that they do produce results. So, um, you know, any, any studies and people with, you know, one thing some of you might want to take away is to think of a, a mobile use case where you actually do study it and see how mobile technology enhances the learning experience. Uh, the first one, um, you know, what happens, uh, what I'm used to in the kind of developer tech world is this idea of evangelism. Uh, you know, which sounds like a grand term, but it really does work. Um, so what happens in the tech world is that people who have a passion for this technology, who understand it, they go out and they show people how it works and the new possibilities. Um, so I think that maybe this is a, I don't know what, you know, EduServe's remit is, but maybe you need some evangelists who go out and actually show the academic staff um, you know, what's possible and how this can I improve your ability to, um, to teach, uh, to do research, um, because you know, one thing I didn't mention is, of course, with sensors and mobiles, there's a huge opportunity for data collection, uh, which helps with research, lots of research programs. So I think evangelism is, it's the only way, actually. You know, have to go out and teach people, inform them, and we should never, it's a grind, but um, we should never underestimate the, the outputs of that. And I think that sounds like what we need in the in the, in the um, universities. Uh, I think I'm up next. <clears throat> I'm, I'm slightly skeptical about the idea of the mobile web and ubiquitous information helping right thinking. And for a long time, many academics are worried about the students being overlaid in Google and those kind of easy sources. Now, if the mobile web means you're saturated in this kind of unpeer reviewed information attitude of control, it's going to make that situation worse. And so maybe it can be a risk as well as a benefit to learning. Yeah, um, that's a good question. So uh, where a lot of the innovation uh, is happening now and the thinking is in um, uh, how you uh, solve the data overload problem. Uh, and so I think we've got to a point really with, with Web 2.0 where just everything is on the web. I mean, the data is available. And for a lot of us, there's too much, too many emails, too many tweets and what have you. Uh, w what is possible now with, with the because basically because of the huge amount of computing power in the cloud, is to make sense of the data and, and therefore to filter it and to, to deliver the right information. That's why I talked about the right time web because that's really now where the thinking is at. We've got the data on the web. How do we make sure it's the right information in the right place? So, so what is right thinking is kind of working backwards from really where you, I think, need to end up with your question, which is, you know, what would constitute right thinking? And, and given I've got all this data, how do I get back? How do I connect the two? And it's, it's certainly possible. You know, software is so powerful now, and with the amount of computing power you can use on demand in the cloud, you can do new stuff. I mean, the idea of, of uh, accessing, getting new meaning from data is certainly a possibility, and it's happening right now. So, so um, you know, maybe you should look at some of the big data projects going on. And uh, I think you might be encouraged that there is, I believe, uh, a way to enhance our thinking through mobile technologies. It's not like we can do it now, maybe, um, but it's certainly it's possible. Okay, I'm going to make this the last question. Yeah. Um, 
Chris Yap, independent consultant. The, the, uh, you touched on the difficulty in San Francisco of now getting access to the infrastructure. I mean, I live in North Oxford, only a mile from the centre, and I can't get a mobile signal in my home. Yeah. Um, we've got. F I, I, the other thing is that I can, of course, have recently started getting towards the point where they've finished allocating, or very, very close to finishing allocating, the address space. Are you comfortable that we know how to build a wireless IP6 network at scale that doesn't have latency problems? Because it seems to me that we may find two years down that the proliferation of always-on devices means that we cannot actually build the infrastructure that will support these apps without massive deterioration in performance. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, in fact, the, the growth of data is really exceeding the capacity of the wireless networks. Um, and I'd say this is, you know, if you look on average across the board and in certain areas, um, it, it already has, San Francisco, downtown London maybe, or there's areas where there's patchiness, where you, where you live, you can't get the signal. Um, so uh, the, the real question is whether or not these new networks can be built and, um, uh, in an economically viable fashion because one of the things that's happened in the industry is the um, huge amount of competition that's led to this kind of lower cost of mobile data is not really uh, in sync with the economics of building these networks because for LTE and things you've got to go out and build a new one. Um, so, um, but the, the technology, um, you know, I think is there um, to, to get us to that place I think the economics is, is, is the issue. And, um, you know, I, I, I have to be careful what I say as I do so much work for O2. Um, so, yeah, I think it's going to work. <laughs> okay. That's a nice place to end. Uh, we now have a coffee break. Can we just briefly say thank you to Paul once again?